Now, how many of y'all were here last week? Come on. How many of y'all enjoyed last week? Look, we started a pretty heavy new series titled Letting Go, okay? And the vision behind this series is to teach you how to let go of your own control in order to allow God to take control in your life and do the things that are impossible for you to do by your own strength. And last week, we talked about David. And David knew a secret to seeing breakthrough of victory over his life. Do you remember what that secret was? It was to what? Pray. Pray first. Look to somebody next to you and tell them, pray first. Pray first before you jump into conflict. Pray first before you put somebody in their place. Pray first before you jump into a relationship you know you should not be in because you have not asked the Lord if you should be in it at all. Pray first. And we learned last week, before you fight a battle physically, you must fight spiritually. Why? The answer can be found out of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, meaning we're fighting a spiritual fight against many powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. But today I want to take this topic even deeper, and I want to show you today out of the Bible that there is a way that you can grow in your relationship with the Lord that you can get even deeper in a relationship with the Lord and allow the things that seem to consume you to get out of the way and put the Lord first. But listen, there's going to be some challenges. Who's ready for the challenge? Come on. Okay. Half of us, some of us, maybe three. That's fine. All right. We're going to keep going. All right. Ready for the challenge. Here's what we're going to teach about today. I want to talk about the topic of fasting. What do you know about fasting? Why do we fast? Lord, is this really the church I meant to come to today? Because I don't know. I had some big plans after service to go get some lunch. And we're talking about fasting today. All right. Let me, let me ask you a fun question, though. Did Jesus command his disciples to fast while he was with them on the earth? Did Jesus command his disciples to fast while he was with them on the earth? Some of y'all are like, mm-hmm, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. What's the answer? Okay. The shocking answer is no. In fact, Jesus was confronted by some people who said, hey, Jesus, hey, we noticed something. We noticed that John the Baptist's disciples, well, they fast. And we noticed that the Pharisees, well, they're always fasting. But how come you never tell or make your own disciples to fast? And this could be found at Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples? And the Pharisees do. Well, Jesus did not hesitate to answer the question. And this is what he said in verse 19 and 20. Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not, right? This is a celebration. They can't fast while the groom is with them. So another question is this, then why do we fast? Why do we fast? If Jesus did not command or make his disciples fast at that moment, then why do we have to put ourselves through such torture with our bodies, right? Well, Jesus wasn't done. Let's continue. What did he say after that? But someday the groom will be taken away from them. And then they will what? They will fast. Jesus was saying, listen, you fast to get close to me. You fast to get close to the presence of God. Maybe it's for answers. Maybe you need direction in your life, or maybe some things are really challenging you right now in your faith, and so you need clear direction from the Lord. You pray and you fast to get that direction, but right now I'm with you, so this is a celebration, not a time to deprive yourself. But Jesus also said, but one day I'm going to be at the right hand of the Father again. And when I leave to be at the right hand of the Father, that is when you should fast again, because listen to this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, Jesus also said, and when you fast... So Jesus didn't command his disciples to fast, but he did say, when you fast, meaning he assumed his followers would fast at times in their life. He said, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled. So people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. Listen to this. Jesus, he he told it like it was. He says, the only reward they'll ever get is that. That is it. They want everybody to compliment them. They want to put it on social media. They want everybody to know, hey, you're fasting right now. Well, that is the biggest reward you get out of this because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. For God sees the heart, right? 
He knows exactly what you need in life. And so he knows if you're fasting just because everybody else is fasting and it looks good from the outside and it's something you want to post and talk about, right? And have you ever met somebody in your life that thinks they are just so holy (laughs) and they brag about it? (laughs) Like, I am so holy. Oh, that's cute. You're fasting for a day? Yeah, I did that back in like third grade. That was hard for me back then. Or maybe they're saying, you know, I'm fasting for 40 days trying to be like Jesus. You know what I mean? Like I could do it all, right? And they brag about it. God knows their heart. And Jesus was saying, listen, that's the only reward they'll get. They want everybody to know what they're doing. But it's in those times in your life where you're truly broken and you need direction and you need help and you run to the Lord and only the Lord. And maybe that's you right now. Maybe you're going through some things. You're dealing with some things and it's stressful, and you feel those burdens on top of your shoulders. Listen, it's in that moment when you're in that corner, or you're in that room in your house, and you're just praying to God, saying, God, I will fast. I'll pray to you. I'll get rid of everything, but that means that I could just hear you more clearly, because what I'm going through right now really hurts. I need your healing. Did you know that pleases the Lord? When your heart is humble before him, what is the definition of a fast? What does it actually mean? I want, to, I want to describe it like this. Fasting is a voluntary act of worship between you and God. It is a voluntary act of worship between you and God, meaning nobody can force you to do it. And God himself is not going to force you to do it either. He's not going to force you and say, hey, wake up right now. You need to seek me. You're making some bad decisions, right? He's going to say, hey, here's a warning but he's not gonna force you to seek him. It has to be your choice to spend time in the Lord's presence, to pray, to fast. Meaning, love and obedience is a choice. You have to choose to love, right? That's why God allowed that one tree, or actually there were two trees, but that one tree in the Garden of Eden, right? That's why he said, listen, you could have all this fruit, but don't touch that one tree. Why? Because true love has to be a choice. Obedience has to be a choice to understand why you follow God in the first place. But I want to share some good news with you as well. Because there are rewards to fasting, according to the Bible, when you fast for the right reasons. Because Jesus continued. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, Jesus said, But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except who? The Father. For he knows what you do in private, and your father who sees everything, listen to this, will do what? He will reward you when you follow him for the right reason. So the title of today's message is this, um, the benefits or the rewards of fasting. The rewards of fasting. Why do we fast? Does it really bring us closer to the Lord? And if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter one. Now, I'm just going to prepare you for this message. I have about 50 scriptures, okay? But you know what? You can just stay in Daniel chapter one, okay? I'll go through all the other ones, but I really want to show you a lot. We're going to go in some depth today out of the word of God. You excited about that? I hope we are. All right. First, let me ask you this question too. Who is Daniel? Okay. Daniel is assumed to come from the lineage of King David. And for about 400 years, King David's descendants have ruled Jerusalem until old King Nebuchadnezzar shows up. You know anything about him? He was a ruthless king of Babylon. Okay. And he came in with his wrath, ready to destroy Jerusalem and destroyed the temple of God. Solomon's temple, the most famous temple ever to have been built upon this earth. It was made out of pure gold. The value that was in the house of the Lord at that time was known all over the world. Yet God allowed an enemy to walk into his holy land, to destroy Jerusalem, to bring God's holy people into captivity and destroy the temple of God. What kind of good God would do that? Let's be honest. Why would God allow such disaster upon his own people, even his own temple? Have you ever said that about your own life? God, how come I keep being attacked right now? God, I feel like everything around me is being taken away. God, I don't understand what kind of good God would allow these bad things to happen in my life. You want to hear the answer? Here it happened. Here's what happened. The people in Jerusalem, they walked away from God. 
to follow the ways of the world. They walked away from God. Everything that God was instructing them to do, to protect them, to put favor on their life. And instead, they followed the ways of the world. Listen to this. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 14 through 16. They followed all the pagan practices of the surrounding nations. They followed the ways of the world. They worship false idols. They offer these sacrifices to these false gods. And then what happened? They desecrated the temple of the Lord, the holy temple of God that had been consecrated in Jerusalem. And so because they followed the ways of the world, they shamed the temple. We would never do anything like that, would we? Unfortunately, many of us do, or many of us have. We have followed the ways of the world and we have shamed the temple of God. What is the temple of God today? Your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. And because we have been influenced by the culture we live in and how relationships look and how we should just sleep around or do all these different things within our life, listen, we bring shame upon the temple of God because we follow the practices of the world because that's what the world does. Shouldn't we do it too? But the world also offers empty promises that just lead to pain, destruction, and bitterness. And so thank you, Jesus, that he came to restore us. Thank you, Jesus, that he came seeing us and already knowing the decisions that we would make, the things that we would regret, the things that have been inside of our heart because we allowed it. And Jesus saw us that upon the cross, he died so that we could be made righteous before the Lord, not by our own strength, but because of Jesus. Raising from the dead to show you how much he loves you, to bring you to life and making your sins go far, far from you. Jesus did this for us. But still, the truth remains. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit living inside of you today. But let's continue the verse, okay? So the Lord, the God of their ancestors, repeatedly sent his prophets to warn them, for he had what? Compassion. Oh, wait a minute. That's not the God I hear about in the Old Testament, right? Because in the world today, everybody's like, well, the God of the Old Testament is so mean, and he's always bringing wrath and judgment and just condemning everybody. But the New Testament God, he's, he's different. No, no. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you'll notice that every time God brings a warning in the Old Testament, he also told them, listen, if you just repent, if you just, if you just come to me, I will show you compassion and forgiveness for his word still stands. So even here, he had compassion on his people and his temple. But the people did what? They mocked the messengers of God, and despised his words. When you follow the ways of the world, you understand you worship the world. And Jesus said, listen, you cannot serve two masters. Why? Because you will love one and you will hate the other. So when you start to love the world, you start to hate the instructions of the Lord for your life. And that's what happened to them. Verse 17, so the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them to humble them. And if you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar at the end of his kingship, it was really interesting because he looked out at his kingdom and said with pride, look at all that I have accomplished. Look at all my power, my authority, everything that I speak. People die, people live by the words that I say. And so God showed up, humbled him, and made him what's known as like one of the first wolf men of the Bible, meaning he went crazy. He went insane. And he started living in the wilderness, and he started eating grass, and his fingernails got really long, and his, his hair grew wild. Like he was insane. This man that used to be such a mighty ruler, God humbled him to show who's really in control. But what's amazing to me is still the compassion that God had because Nebuchadnezzar actually came back to his mind. God allowed him to see grace, and he came back as a king over uh, Babylon. So it's crazy. But God is the one that is in control, okay? And let me also word it like this so that a lot of us can understand why God allowed such disaster upon his people. The reason why is because God knows what it feels like to be cheated on. Look at the wording a lot of times in the Old Testament. God loved Israel, but Israel was unfaithful. 
Israel would turn to false gods and, and worship the things of the world that can never satisfy or fulfill. So this teaches us a very powerful warning. Here it is. You ready? When you walk away from God, you walk away from his protection. It's true. When you walk away from God, you want to do your own thing? Fine. Do your own thing. Want to follow the ways of the world? Fine. Let the world protect you. The world doesn't care about you. The world will, will chew you up and spit you out. God cares about you. He will protect you. But when you walk away from God, you walk away from his protection. So now they became captives in the land of Babylon. And this is where our story begins. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Then the king ordered, King Babylon, I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. And he said, select one strong, healthy and good looking young men, he said. Make sure they are very well versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. So David was one of those chosen for this experiment. And the other three men, you may know their, their Babylonian names. It was Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, right? And if you know that story, they were placed in the fire, but they were not burned. Why? Because it says the angel of the Lord was with them. It was really Jesus. It was Jesus in there with them in the fire and made sure that they did not get burned. But for three years, here's what um, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do with them. He wanted to train them for three years to learn the Babylonian language, but also to eat his food. Okay, I'm listening. <laughs> what you got for me, king? All right. Pretty much the same food the king ate, the delicacies of Babylon, he was placing it in front of them as a gift. You could eat all you want free buffet, all the free wine you want, every bit of it. It's right before you. You could have every bit of it. It is all yours. And some of us at this moment would be like, well, this isn't that bad. All right, I see chicken. Okay, you got steak over there. You got lobster and macaroni and cheese. Like, oh, Neb, you bad for this. I'm ready. Let's be honest. A lot of us would say, yes. Let me dig in. Daniel said no. Like, isn't it a sin to say no to free food? Like, why would he do something like that? And what I want to show you today is this cool revelation of why he said no. But in this moment, he decided to do a fast, and it was really a vegetarian diet. Just eat vegetables and drink water, and that was it. But he decided to say no. And he saw these amazing miracles and benefits take place in his life that should also be a wake-up call to us all. So for the rest of the sermon, I'm going to teach you three points we can learn from Daniel and this fast right here, okay? So point number one, fasting will kill the beast of gluttony. Fasting will kill the beast of gluttony. Okay, I'm about to get in your grill and talk about your grill at the same time. That's a little pastor joke. Let's keep going. Okay, so anyway, all right. So let me make this clear though. Gluttony is not food. What? Gluttony is not food. Gluttony is a false God that controls your heart and controls the thing that you do. Gluttony is that thing calling you from the back of your mind saying, you really need this right now. You really need to consume this right now. If you don't consume this, you're not going to make it through. You better put this in you right now, in your heart, in your life. See, we think it's a choice of control. We think we can control what we consume, but eventually, here's what gluttony does. The spirit of gluttony will come and start to consume you. And the Bible makes it very clear that gluttony wants to devour you to where you can't say no to anything and you're constantly giving everything over because of your flesh. Let's read this together. Philippians chapter three, verse 18 and 19. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, listen, whose God is their belly. Listen to this. Why would it say that? Whose God is their belly, for this is a worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporary things that will not last. Emotional needs, I need this right now to feel better, right? 
When we're sad, what do we do? We consume things. When we're happy, what do we do? We consume things. When we're going through stress, what do we do? We consume, we consume, we consume everything of the world. But how many of you fast? How many of you run into the presence of the Lord to be consumed by God instead so that you can actually get a clear answer of what you need, right? We rush to the things of the world because we think it's going to satisfy. So right here in Philippians chapter three, it says, listen, don't follow the God of your bellies, okay? Because gluttony is an idol. In fact, you ready for this? Why was Sodom destroyed? There's a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons was gluttony. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50. Sodom's sins were what? Were pride, gluttony, and laziness. While the poor and needy suffered outside her door, she was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out as you have seen. What took place in their hearts? Pride. This, I've achieved all this on my own, just like Nebuchadnezzar. I have done this, and because I have pride in my life, I can get more things. So being consumed by wanting more, this gluttony of life, if I just have more, I'll be happy. Isn't that what we see on TV, in music, everywhere you go? If you just had what they had, you'd be happy. You know, this weekend... We took my family uh, to Target, and uh, it was my little girl's birthday. She turned six, so pray for me, okay, because she's getting too old too fast, and I'm scared over that. And um, one of my boys got him a gift, too, because, you know, you got you to get them all a gift, right? Otherwise, somebody's going to cry. So got him a gift, too, and he was really excited about the gift until he saw something else. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't like, oh, he wasn't excited about it anymore. And I said, listen, listen, don't allow comparison to steal your happiness and joy. Always be grateful for what you have because listen, that doesn't go away just because you get older. <laughs> that doesn't go away just because you feel like you're, you're wise now or things are better in your life. No, no, no. There will always be things that you see and say, man, I like that. Or the devil's always tempting you. Hey, this relationship over here, I bet it's better than yours. Or you can, you can achieve this and, and go that way if you just left your family. Do this and that, right? Comparison will rob you of the joy. And so being grateful, listen to me, is a weapon. It's a weapon against the enemy and the things that he's shooting at you. But listen, Sodom got to a point where they no longer could control the sensual appetite that they had. And that's why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. All right? So what does gluttony do in your life? Gluttony will make you weak. Will make you weak. You will have to say yes to everything that wants to consume you. Okay, 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 okay. Until you look in the mirror and you feel like nothing left of you is there. Because you consumed everything else. You become weak because you cannot say no. And let me say it like this. Here's a warning as well. Okay? What you consume can either deplete you or give you nutrients. What you consume in your life will either deplete you or give you nutrients, and the outcome is based on your decisions. And I've heard it over and over again. Well, God blessed them more than me. Are you sure? Are you sure? Let's, let's say it's the subject of money, right? We look at somebody else. Well, they have so many things that I want right now, pastor. You don't understand. I've prayed about that, but what if, what if, what if God started you out with the same financial blessing he started this person out with, but this person gave and trusted you, and let go of their control, and, and trusted you first, and then they, they allowed biblical principles to teach them how to save, and how to be good with their money, but what did you do? For a lot of us, let's be honest, I've been there. You got money in your hands? I got emotional needs. I got things that I want to buy right now, things that I need, and so we, we get and get and get until we have nothing left, and then we point the finger at God. We point the finger at somebody else. God, you bless them more. No. God is saying, you just didn't see that what I gave you in the beginning was a blessing. And until you see it as a blessing, you won't see more favor in your life because you've walked away from me and walked away from the favor and protection I have for you. Let's continue the story because, listen, Daniel said no. So if gluttony makes you weak, fasting to God makes you what? Strong. By the Lord's strength, 
You're able to overcome things you never thought you could. Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself. Underline that. We'll get back to that. Okay. By eating the food and the wine given to them by the king. And so we asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the, the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, Nebuchadnezzar who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale, he's saying, and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Verse 12 and 13, but Daniel said, all right, test us for 10 days. And so this is a 10 day fast, a vegetarian fast. Um, and it's one of the first fasts. I'm gonna go over the different fasts that Daniel did out of the book of Daniel, but this fast is a test. And I'm gonna show you why in a minute. Okay, and it says on diets of vegetables and water. And at the end of the 10 days, he says, see how we look. Compared to the other young men who were eating the king's food, then make your decision in the light of what you see what happened. If you know the story, here's the first reward of fasting. Your body becomes healthier. Your body can even look better in most cases when you fast. In fact, in the fitness industry today, most people fast to do what? To what? To speed up their metabolism. There's even diets out there where you fast that, will, that is able to burn, right? The fat that's in your body for energy. You get leaner. You get healthier. Guess what? Because a lot of things that we consume in life today, guess what they can bring upon you? Depression and anxiety. Stress, high blood pressure, all these things within our life. And maybe you're saying, but pastor, you don't know my life. I'm too busy. The only thing I have time to eat is McDonald's on the way there. All right? Over and over again. Listen, if you're consuming something so much and it's killing you, why? Why? And it doesn't just have to be food. And we're going to get there, okay? Because gluttony is not just food. It's a false god in your life. Something you think you need that is actually killing you. And taking you out. The Bible says that Daniel actually looked better than everybody else. It looked better. Why? Because they fasted a healthier diet that honored the Lord. Daniel chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and the wine provided for the others. And according to an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a practice of just intermittent fasting can increase, listen to this, a longer life, a leaner body, and a sharper mind. A sharper mind. See, Daniel understood what you eat affects your body. You ever eaten so much you can't think? <laughs> Or like all you want to do is sleep. Maybe that's you right now. You had a big breakfast and you're like, Pastor, I'm trying right now to listen to you, right? And Daniel understood what you eat affects your body. Guess what gluttony wants to do? Gluttony wants to kill you way too early. You were created for a purpose and the image of the Lord to do his will, to share his gospel. But God has given you your physical body as a vehicle to do his work, to do his will. And if you don't take care of the vehicle, what happens? You'll break down way too soon, okay? So that's point number one. But I want to show you that Daniel understood something deeper than just looking better, okay? Point number two is this. Fasting strengthens your soul to resist temptation. Fasting will strengthen your soul to resist temptation. What is your soul? According to the Bible, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. The most unstable thing about us how we feel. Right now, God, I don't feel good. I bet that ice cream will make me feel better. Right now, God, I, I don't, I'm not happy with my life. If I just consume some things I know that I want, then I will feel better. Listen, if you're led by your feelings, you'll always fall for the devil's lies. Your emotions, relationships, everything, you'll always fall for the lies because you want it in the moment, but you're not seeing with spiritual eyes what God is warning you about. The only way you can resist the devil is by humbling yourself before God first. Let me show you. James chapter four, verse six through eight. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So do what? Humble yourselves before God. 
Then notice what comes after. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Humble yourself before the Lord. Give it all over to the Lord. Then you'll be able to resist the devil. He will flee from you. Come close to God. I love this. And God will come close to you. It's in the presence of the Lord when you're praying and fasting and saying, God, I'm tired of being consumed by everything else. I just need you right now. A devotion to the Lord can change your life. A true devotion to the Lord. Let me, let me teach you something important that Daniel knew that a lot of us overlook. Why did Daniel say no, okay? Listen, he said no to the king's food because he realized in this situation, whatever food he ate, listen, was also a devotion to the king he served. A devotion to the king that he served. I love the New King James Version, how it words it. Daniel chapter one, verse eight, for Daniel purposed in his what? His heart, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine in which he drank, meaning he, he set apart in his heart to be devoted to God. He risked everything. The king is doing something nice. Here's all my food. Do you understand by Daniel rejecting this? He could lose his life. But what's he saying? He's making a declaration in front of everybody saying, listen, I'm devoted to God. God is my king before I'm devoted to the king of Babylon. And I will follow the Lord because guess what? Most likely, because this is Babylon, these meats were sacrificed to the idols of Babylon. Okay? Not only that, but it broke Jewish law for him to eat this at this time. It broke the Jewish law for him to eat this. So he knew that it's either break God's commandment, break the law, and follow the pressures of the world, what everybody else is doing. It looks good, right? I mean, who, who could say no to free food? But everything the devil puts in front of you that he says is free always comes with a cost. What did he also say in the Garden of Eden? He said, you can eat the apple, the, or not the apple, but the fruit. I've seen so many apples in those pictures. You could eat the fruit. Be like God, right? Now, what happened? There was a cost. Sin fell into the world. Sin fell into the world. And the things that they did, they regretted. They regretted these things. Why? Because the devil will lie and say, there's no cost. It's just free food. So this was a public decoration of who was his king and who he was devoted to. So let me ask you the same question. Who are you devoted to? Are you devoted to the ways of the world? Or are you devoted to God? Well, how do I know? Who do you run to? What do you run to when your soul is crying out? When your soul is hurt, when your mind feels attacked, when your emotions are haywire and all over the place, when you feel like there's just nothing happening in your life, what and who do you run to? Because guess what a lot of us run to? We overlook that table. Uh, vegetables, that's nice. All right, over here. I'm having a bad day. So if I just consume some of these sweets, I'll feel better. If I just have some of this, I'll feel better. And then top it off with some ice cream, right? Just keep eating, keep eating, keep eating. For a lot of us, this is a good time. Unless this is how you deal with your emotions. And you go to food because it's the only thing that makes you feel better. It becomes a God. It becomes an idol. Let me say it like this. What consumes you that you have to have it in order to cope? Because for a lot of us too, maybe you've been there, maybe you're there right now. You got in a relationship that, that broke up and then guess what? This drink will make you feel better. You don't have to think about anything, right? Just bottoms up. Every time it's what the world says, go out. Want to think about that? Just drink, 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 drink. Guess what? You'll forget about your problems because you'll pass out. And then the next day, you know what? When problems come back again, drink again, drink again. Just keep drinking. Why not? Just keep drinking until you are dead. I've seen it. I've seen the dangers of alcohol when it's overtaken somebody. My brother is an alcoholic. I've seen it consume him. I know what it's done to the family. But the thing is, he got to a point where this became his God, and he couldn't cope. And guess what? We do it in different ways, too. I don't want to think about life. I don't want to have a hard conversation. Let's just watch this. 
Let's not talk about our problems. I don't want to talk about this today. I'm not in the mood. Or we grab this phone and swipe and swipe and swipe. I just need some dopamine, God. I need to feel better about myself. Let me post a picture, God. I just need a like. I just need somebody to make a comment and tell me that I'm, I'm somebody or that I'm beautiful today or that I look good or that they like this, God. I just need somebody to tell me I have worth. Somebody to tell me that I matter. We're consumed by these things to where when we walk away from it, we twitch. It's an addiction. Like a drug addict going back to a drug, we go back to these things because they consumed us. None of this is a sin until it becomes your God. You understand that? All this is okay until it becomes your God, until it consumes you, until you can't keep going unless you go back to this when you're hurt and you're saying, God, I just need somebody to tell me I matter. The Lord already has. Did you know that God keeps track of every tear that you've cried? Psalm 56, verse 8. You keep track of all my sorrows, and you've collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one, Lord, in your book. You matter to God. David said out of Psalm 41, verse 4, Lord, be merciful to me. Listen to this. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. For David committed adultery. And he said, God, heal my soul. I fell under that lie that I could be better on the other side. And I made many mistakes. Who is the God of your belly consuming you? And so in this moment, Daniel says, no, I don't want to be enslaved to that. So I'm going to make a, a, a statement here of who I follow, who I'm devoted to. And let's be honest, this doesn't look as nice as that looks over there. Before time, it's good in your life to practice getting rid of the things that control you, to redirect your heart with the Lord and be in the Bible and say, God, you know what? By your word, by your word, I know who I am. God, by your word, I know that you'll never leave me. I know that you love me. I know that you're in my situation. By your word, Father, I know that you can give me peace today. And it's been a long time since I've had peace. And that keeps lying to me. And it's bringing me stress and anxiety. And the devil's laughing in my face. But over here, there's victory. And I will consume what makes me healthy and what makes me strong. And it heals my soul. That's what I need you to understand about fasting. That's what it means. An act of worship between you and God. And listen, some of the rewards that come are actually a sharper mind to be able to think more clear about life and your decisions. Daniel chapter one, verse 17. Listen to this. It says, for these four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and skill in literature and wisdom. Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them to be, listen to this, 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who are in his realm. Why? Because David, I mean, Daniel devoted his heart to God. And when you devote your heart to God, listen, you become wise because of the Lord's wisdom. And so he was seen as wise, and that's why he kept getting elevated and elevated and elevated into a new position every time. But here's my last point, okay? God will heal your soul with fasting. God will make your body healthier. But the last point, and this is so interesting, fasting breaks spiritual barriers in your life. Did you know when Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he was directly in the presence of God, and he was fasting for 40 days? and 40 nights. That's when God spoke through him the Ten Commandments. What did Jesus do? Before he went out and really started his ministry, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And so we see this spiritual breakthrough that takes place. And for Daniel, because a lot of us have heard, okay, it's a new year. <laughs> and, and, and we've heard about the Daniel fast over and over again, 21 days of, of fasting or this for fasting. But did you know that Daniel actually fasted three times out of the book of Daniel? And at least two of them were different. Daniel chapter one, what we've been talking about was a vegetarian diet for 10 days, but it was a test. 
to show who he was devoted to. There was a reason. And Daniel chapter nine, verse three, says he fasted for Israel's forgiveness. And he prayed to the Lord, how long will we be in captivity? When are you going to set us free? And Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel visited him and told him that there would be 70 years altogether of being in exile, but then you will go back to your homeland. And Gabriel even mentioned to him about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, in this fast, as he was fasting for the forgiveness of Israel's sins. Listen, today though, how are we forgiven? Jesus, Jesus, fasting doesn't make you righteous with God. It just humbles your heart before the Lord. We're made righteous by God through Christ and what he paid for us upon that cross, okay? But also in Daniel chapter 10, verses two through three, Daniel fasted for how long? 21 days, three weeks, no food, no wine. He didn't even bathe. I don't recommend that part, okay? If you wanna do that, that's, that's on you and the Lord, all right? I'm not gonna recommend that part. Let me also say this, I don't recommend 40 days either, 40 nights, because if you look at it, Moses was only able to do that because he was directly in the presence of God with the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus, of course, was able to do it because he is the son of God. For most of us or all of us, we would die if you fasted no water and no food for 40 days and 40 nights, all right? But what I really want you to understand about fasting is that Daniel didn't just say, okay, it's a new year. Let me just do this for a certain amount of time. And that's not a bad thing but he fasted multiple times throughout his life when he needed answers, when he needed to make a statement, when he needed a change, a spiritual breakthrough in his life, okay? Because also the Bible warns us of fake fasting. Isaiah 58 verse three, the people cried out to God and said, why have we fasted? They said, and have you not seen us, Lord? We have afflicted our souls and you do not take notice. And then if you continue reading the chapter, God was saying, listen, you're fasting for the wrong reasons. You're fasting to win an argument. You're fasting because you want something, but you're not wanting me in your heart. But then to fast for the right reasons, Isaiah 58 verse 11, the Lord will guide you and continuously satisfy your soul in a drought. Stop right there and really pay attention. Are you in a drought? Are you in a time where you're praying, but you feel like you're hitting a wall? feeling like you just don't know how to get through this, feeling like you're not receiving answers from the Lord. Listen, the Lord is saying it is in times where you're praying and fasting that you feel like you're in a drought, but I will satisfy your soul and strengthen your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose water does not fail. I remember uh, when I pursued evangelism in Louisiana and doing, doing authentic for the first time, I had anxiety and stress and I'm like, low Lord, I don't know how to do this. There's no way I can do this. And so I decided to fast personally for just a day. And I can't tell you how I just, I, I heard the Lord just, just speak to me all day. And this is comfort and this peace. And by the end of the day, I just knew that he was in control. Like all of your control and allow God to take control. There are testimonies of people that have prayed and fasted, have seen miracles in their life, answers that they've needed. In fact, many times out of the Bible, God speaks to us through our dreams, right? In the middle of the night. Think about it like this, in the morning, why do we call it breakfast? It means break fast. For a lot of us, that's the longest time we fast. In the middle of the night. And the Lord speaks to us because our body, our flesh is asleep, but there's a spiritual connection taking place. Isn't that amazing? And so even with Daniel, he was elevated because he had this spiritual connection because he knew when to fast. He knew when to come into the Lord's presence. And at the end, we see, well, we see out of uh, the book of Daniel, chapter one or chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of the future and he was terrified. And he asked the magicians and everybody to do something which seemed impossible. Not only tell me my dream, but interpret it. And they said, there's nobody that can do this. There's nobody that is able, this is impossible. But listen, what is impossible for man is what? It's possible for who? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Daniel chapter two, verse 27, 28. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said the secret which the king had demanded. He said, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayer cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets 
and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the latter days. Do you understand? Daniel could have taken all the credit and just say, hey, I know the answer. I know what you dreamed. But instead, what did he say? There's a God who hears, who spoke to me. Where did he learn that? He learned that through fasting to be able to kill the beast of gluttony, to be able to submit to God and resist temptation, to be able to see spiritual breakthroughs within his life. And great was his reward because his heart was after God. Daniel chapter two, verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. And each king that came after Nebuchadnezzar knew about his reputation, knew about him being able to interpret dreams and hear the voice of the one true God. Because Daniel understood the secret of breakthrough through fasting, through prayer. Can I be staying right here? I'm asking a prayer team to come up front. Listen. Let's be honest. Something on this table something not on this table? Is it consuming you? To the point where you can't get by unless you go back to it. You can't deal with your emotions. You can't let go of the bitterness and hate in your heart over what somebody did to you. And this is how you've been coping. Can I be honest with you today? That's the spirit of gluttony that will kill you. Because gluttony wants to consume you. But listen, you can come up to this altar today. And you can ask God for freedom. Freedom from the things that control you. And on your own, you can decide to fast. God, for this time, I'm going to give up this one thing. Because I've noticed that I'm going to this more than I'm coming to you. Or God, maybe right now I, I need you. Or maybe in this message today, maybe you didn't understand that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and there have been some things in your life that you've done it feels like there's shame an enemy's throwing condemnation over and over again but listen when you humble yourself before God there's freedom and it's when we come up here that we put God first fasting is just a form of worship there are many forms of worship between you and God and you can come up to here today and say, God, I know, I know, I, I know this doesn't look good and I don't know the answers, but what I do know is I need more of you. And I put so many other things in front of you and it's time to push those things aside. Push the plate aside to follow you. Hey guys, it's Pastor Bobby Chandler and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.